People make decisions every day. Uh, for example, before you go outside, you kind of have an if statement that says, if it's raining, then I need to get my jacket. And computers are amazing once you decide those kinds of statements that they can reliably execute those things at unbelievable speed. And so a computer program really uh, is a little bit of math and some if statements uh, where the decision gets made. So in, in this puzzle, the if block helps the zombie make a decision. Right. It checks something. For example, let's use the block that says, if there's a path to the left, and put a turn left command inside it. So we're telling the zombie to check its surrounding, see if there's that path on the left, and if so, make that turn. And then we use the move forward block inside this repeat uh, to get it to keep moving forward as long as it just wants to go straight. Uh, then when there's the turn, the if block will tell it to make this turn to the left. And you can see if we do that, if we're taking the turns to the left and otherwise moving forward, we'll achieve our goal. So it's an example of using an if statement, which is really a, a fundamental concept in computer programming. Uh, one of the first things I learned was uh, uh, how to write a program to play tic-tac-toe. And you know, so I had if statements to say, okay, if the other person is about to win, go ahead and, and block that uh, spot. Uh, so have fun learning how to use if statements. It's a, a key concept. I, I taught myself how to program computers when I was a kid um, and uh, um, bought my first computer when I was 10 and sold my first commercial program when I was 12. I was I went into a store in South Africa and saw um, a Commodore VIC-20 um, and um, I guess maybe I was nine years old, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere at that time. And um, I thought this was like you know, the, you know, the most awesome thing I'd ever seen and you could like make this, write computer programs and make games and, and I played you know, Atari and other things, like other games, consoles, um, when I was like maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of being able to like create games, I thought was really exciting. Programming is where you're describing to the machine how to do something. And so telling it how to play tic-tac-toe, telling it how to play the game board game Monopoly, telling it uh, how to convert numbers from one base to another. And the idea of, okay, there's these simple instructions, but if you put them together, then you can synthesize something quite complex. Uh, it's a fascinating kind of mathematical thing. How can you make it fast? How can you make it small? And I went through several phases of doing more complex programs where people who were great programmers would look at my work, give me feedback on it, and you, know, you get so you, you're, you can be a, quite a good programmer. And it was kind of a, such a, a intense activity between the age of 13 and 17 uh, that you know, we learned a lot. Uh, eventually, one of the programs we took on was the idea of the scheduling of, of our school. When should the classes meet? Who should be in which section? So you have all these requests for people who want different classes and keeping them small and not having the teachers teach too many classes in a row. Very complex kind of software problem. And actually, when the school first asked me to do it, uh, when I was 15, I said that I, I didn't know how. And they asked some adults to do it, and that didn't work. Uh, and then about a year later, I'd figured out how to do it. And so my friends and I actually did the software that did all this high school scheduling. Um, it had some fantastic uh, benefits to us. And we got paid for doing it. It was exactly the kind of com complex problem that uh, developed my skills very well. And, you know, we got some degree of control over who was in our classes. And uh, so, you know, it, it combined the best of everything. Initially, when that teletype showed up, there were probably 20 kids who sort of showed an interest. And it was confusing enough that it got winnowed down to about uh, eight or nine fairly quickly who were quite serious about it. And then uh, there were about four of us who were hyper serious, you know, kind of doing it day and night. And uh, two of them were 
two years older than I was, and one I was my same age. Now, in a high school, people are two years ahead of you. You know, they don't socialize with the young kids all that much. Uh, so the idea that we had this group of four of us, you know, it's kind of unusual. We called it the Lakeside Programming Group. And one of the companies we'd been doing work for went bankrupt, the one in Seattle. And so we went to one in Portland, Oregon, Computer Center Corporation, C-Cubed, uh, which had been in the University District in Seattle. And we'd spent a lot of time there. And they were wonderful to us. They weren't a well-run business, so they went bankrupt. So this company uh, down in Portland, Oregon, said, hey, we're not just going to give you computer time. You have to do something. So we agreed to write this payroll program. And a payroll program is surprisingly complicated. There's all these taxes and reports and things uh, at the state level and federal level. Anyway, uh, they said, well, if you could write one of those, we'd at least give you free computer time. And so I negotiated that deal. And the two older members, uh, Paul Allen and Rick, said, well, you know, this is, there's not enough work to go around, so we're gonna take charge of this. And I said, okay, you know, I'm not that interested because I had in mind how I wanted to do the payroll program. And so they, they messed around for about three months, didn't get much done, uh, and then said, well, you, you join back up. And I said, okay, but, you know, if so, I'm in charge uh, of this. And, you know, it's going to kind of set a precedent for future activities. But they said, no, no, that's fine. And so we worked, we actually finished this payroll program. It was a lot of work. Uh, the friend who was my age, uh, Kent Evans, and I ended up doing the lion's share of the work. Now, tragically, right as he and I finished that, he was killed in a, a mountain climbing accident. And um, so then there were, there were just three of us left who'd been extremely involved, including Paul Allen, uh, who was the one who was reading the magazines even more than I was. And he was the one who actually saw this computer on a chip, so-called microprocessor, uh, in a very small, obscure article, but he saw that it would be deeply important and brought that to me uh, in 1971. So we were still 15, I was 15, and he was 17 um, at the time. So these CQ people have this computer, which is a time-sharing computer, and they're letting us come in at night. And they had this deal with the company who made the computer, Digital Equipment Corporation, that they had this acceptance period. If they could find problems with it, they could delay their rental payments. And so they thought of us as kind of monkeys that might find some problems and help them delay their rental payments. Well, that, that was a fair analysis because at first we were just completely goofing around. Like we'd have, try to run hundreds of jobs at the same time or have all the jobs try and grab the same resources to see if we could get the system to fail. And we did in kind of this brute force approach. And so that would, they would report that as a problem and delay their rental payment. Well, as a few months went by, actually about four months by the end of it, we had gotten very uh, uh, sophisticated. In fact, we'd gotten the source code of the operating system out of the garbage can and were reading it. And the kind of problems we were finding were far more subtle. In fact, we'd not only find the problem, we'd look and we'd suggest how they might fix it. Well, anyway, digital equipment got so tired of this, they said, look, you gotta pay. You're gonna be able to find problems, these, these kinds of problems forever, but we need to get paid. And so then there was a question whether they would let us stay there or not. And it was pretty tenuous. Um, and so Paul and I, you know, we understood the system well enough that we could look at all the passwords of the various uh, accounts. And so, you know, we could use literally any account. And um, then people, when they found out we'd done that, they got kind of mad about that. They weren't sure how mad they should be about it because we hadn't really caused any damage. But, you know, it wasn't a, a good thing.
You know, computer hacking was literally just being invented uh, at the time. And so fortunately we got off with a bit of a warning, but there actually was a period that because of that, they said we weren't supposed to use the computer. And it was over a summer and Paul actually went up to the University of Washington and found ways to use the computer uh, and get connected up. Uh, and he, he took a while before he told me and then eventually he told me about that and we got, we got back on. I was really quite serious about math at the time and various science things. Uh, Paul had actually read more science fiction than I had by, I mean, by a lot. Uh, and so he and I would talk about that. But I had plenty of things. It was not, wasn't some great tragedy. But then we got, you know, pulled back in. Then that company went bankrupt. And then we had the uh, work for this uh, Portland company on the payroll program. And then we had the, the scheduling program. And so, you know, we were lucky. There were always kind of things that not only gave us an opportunity, but exposed us uh, to that next level. You know, after the payroll program, then there was a, a computer project to use computers to control all the electricity grid in the dams of the Pacific Northwest. It's a government agency called Bonneville Power had uh, done a contract with a company called TRW to use computers to do all this control. And TRW had committed to do all this really high reliability, great software work. Well, they found it more difficult than they expected. And so they um, were looking for people who understood uh, the, these kinds of computers, which Paul and I, Paul Allen and I, had done a lot of work on. This was the same computer that was at Computer Center Corporation and at this Portland company, Information Sciences. Anyway, so they, they, we were kind of famous, but nobody had met us because we'd filed these problem reports. And by the end of these problem reports, we, they were so sophisticated, it was like, who are these guys? You know, out in Seattle telling us how to fix all this stuff. And so when TRW is saying, hey, we're desperate, find us, uh, they're telling digital equipment who makes these things, find us the best programmers. And somebody says, well, there's Gates and Allen. And somebody says, well, nobody's really met them. But yeah, but they're really good. We, you know, we ought to be able to track them down. So they <laughs> find us, <laughs> this one guy, and we go for an interview and they, you know, these two kids show up and what was I when I was interviewed? I was 16 uh, when they interviewed me. So they're like, well, we can't hire you. But you know, then they talk to us about software and we clearly know a lot. And when you're young and you know a lot, people don't have any kind of intermediate thing. You're either you know, what you're supposed to be, which is a kid who doesn't know that much, or they think, whoa, what, you know, this guy's the limit. Well, we were pretty good programmer. But anyway, so we got jobs at this TRW, and that exposed me to some programmers who were way better than I was, who critiqued my work. I could look at their work. You know, this one guy uh, was really a phenomenal programmer, and he would just take my stuff and rip it apart. Uh, you know, in this super constructive way. Anyway, it was it was a brilliant thing. And, and so part of my senior year uh, and the summer before and after the senior year, uh, Paul and I were down in uh, Vancouver, Washington, uh, working on this project. So it kind of took our understanding to a whole new level and it exposed us to a bunch of uh, people there. And, you know, Paul the whole time, ever since he'd seen that Michael Krauss article was saying, you know, there's an opportunity here, this is going to be big, you know, we ought to think what we're going to do about this. So we kept, kept talking about that. <laughs>